Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Stacey Satang with the Housing Alliance of Pennsylvania. Thank you for joining us. Today's title, today's title is The Utility Moratorium is Ending Soon, What You Need to Know. To let everyone know, the presentation is being recorded and will run approximately 60 minutes, including Q&A time. Additionally, uh, please note that anything in the chat feature will be saved. We will be sending you a link via email to this recording within the next couple of days, ideally Friday, as well as uploading it to our YouTube channel and posting it on our website. Attendees, you'll be muted during today's presentation. If you have questions for the presenters, please type them in the Q&A box in the bottom of your screen. If you have a logistical question for myself or other Housing Alliance staff, please use the chat. The chat feature should not be used for questions for the presenters. I'll now turn it over to Brian Fuss to, re to begin today's presentation. Uh, welcome. Thank you for uh, coming to the presentation today. And we are going to start with some welcome and introductions. So I will first say my name is Brian Fuss. I'm the uh, Policy and Program Director at the Housing Alliance for PA. I just started in November, so I'm relatively new. Uh, we advocate for common sense uh, solutions to housing issues within the Commonwealth. And we work uh, very closely with PULP and CLS on um, uh, evictions and also um, energy efficiency. Now, Liz. Oh, thanks, uh, Brian. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, the Pennsylvania Utility Law Project is a statewide legal services program within the Legal Aid Network, um, and we work uh, on a range of statewide issues that affect low-income individuals' ability to connect and maintain utility services uh, to their home. And so we do so by representing low-income individuals and group clients before the Pennsylvania Utility Commission and in a range of policy matters before other administrative agencies and uh, uh, courts. We also uh, operate a small utility uh, termination hotline for customers facing loss of utility service, and we provide a lot of technical assistance and support throughout the legal aid community um, and the nonprofit community groups who are assisting customers who may be able to uh, may not be able to maintain affordable services. And I'll turn it to Rob to introduce CLS. Thank you both. Um, good afternoon. I'm Robert Ballinger from the Energy Unit at Community Legal Services in Philadelphia. Um, Community Legal Services provides a range of um, civil legal services to low-income Philadelphians um, regarding you know, the essential subjects of, of life, employment, housing, and in my case, you know, obviously utilities. And in our unit, um, we do provide direct representation to individual consumers. We provide group pre representation, excuse me, to um, organizations whose members are low income uh, with the overall goal of ensuring access to affordable utility service uh, for the low income citizens of Pennsylvania. Um, we have a separate role um, that I'm very active in, which is we also represent all of the residential customers of our gas utility and our water utility in local governance matters. So those things that are not within the scope of the PUC's jurisdiction. Uh, that function is referred to as the, the public advocate. You may have heard of that role in Philadelphia at some point. Um, so with that, I think we can get started. I'll just go over the uh, the agenda real quick here. Um, we're going to talk about the, the current moratorium um, that's in place and what that means. There's actually two of them. And we'll talk about ways that um, Pennsylvanians can take steps to avoid losing service uh, in the event the moratorium is lifted. We'll talk about the assistance programs that are available to low-income Pennsylvanians. And we'll talk about some strategies how you might uh, advise someone to connect or reconnect service in an affordable way. 
We'll touch on tenant utility rights. There are special statutory provisions for tenants um, that can be very useful and that provide a lot of protections for tenants. And we'll talk about federal rental and utility assistance, uh, the, the 850 million or so that the state is receiving um, from the federal government as part of the, the stimulus. Uh, finally, of course, uh, you'll have our contact info and we'll address any questions that come up. Time permitting, of course. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So um, when we talk about the moratorium here uh, for this presentation, what we're talking about is the, the protections that the Public Utility Commission has put in place to ensure that in the context of a pandemic, a public health emergency, um, and of course, in the context of a, a cold winter, people who can't afford to necessarily pay in full and on time are not subjected to a loss of service. So that, that's the, the moratorium we're gonna talk about and who's affected by that are all of the privately owned water, electric, natural gas companies and some of the uh, wireline telecommunication providers. Those are the utilities that we're talking about here. Um, with only a couple of exceptions, the municipal owned um, and municipal operated utilities are not subject to the PUC's jurisdictions, nor are um, the providers of, of fuel oil, like the, um, the delivery oil trucks that you sometimes see um, providing fuel for, for customers in their homes. Um, so the unregulated utilities are not subject to the PUC's jurisdiction. So they're not technically subject to either of the two moratoriums that we'll talk about unless they uh, sort of take their own action to follow suit. And many of them have. Let's go to the next slide. So um, the first moratorium we're going to talk about is, is really the COVID-19 moratorium. And so back in March, uh, when everyone realized that we were in the in the grips of a pandemic, the PUC issued an emergency order. And that order prohibited all of the PUC regulated utilities. So again, all of the, the, the privately owned or investor owned utilities and some, uh, just a couple of the municipal utilities from terminating service to folks who could not afford to pay for it. That didn't mean that, of course, uh, that the utility would be required to provide service to somewhere where it wasn't safe to provide service. So if you know someone who's lost service, probably the answer is, is that they have some kind of condition in the house that makes it unsafe for them. But otherwise, um, folks who have not been able to keep up with their bills have been protected from a loss of service since March 13th um, until October 13th and, and, and thereafter, um, the PUC sort of scaled back the scope of that moratorium. So when it was absolute from March 13th through the effectiveness of the action it took in, in October, um, that, that, that no longer was the case in full. So they put in a sort of a limited, what they call phase two of the moratorium to begin on November 9th that still protects the majority of the folks who we deal with in my office, community legal services, low income Pennsylvanians, for the most part are still protected by the COVID-19 moratorium. The, the October 13th order established what are called protected customers, individuals who are, their household is at or below 300% of the federal poverty level. They have some obligations to maintain protected status, they have to apply for all available assistance programs and seek a, a payment arrangement if they're eligible. And during the period of time that the phase two of the moratorium remains in effect, those individuals are protected from a loss of service and the utilities can't um, tack on additional costs like late fees or reconnection fees or ask, ask for deposits that they ordinarily could ask for. In addition to the protections um, based on, uh, on just applying for assistance programs, the PUC put in place uh, a right to get two additional medical certifications. Medical certification is a 30-day hold on utility service termination and provided a more generous time frame for the customer to provide that medical certification, which has to be in writing from a doctor's office. They also encourage the utilities to use flexible means to verify income status, including allowing a, a customer, um, if, if they are so inclined, to self-certify their income. Um, those flexible requirements were not enshrined very specifically. So some utilities may be being more flexible than others. 
Okay, so the timeline. The second moratorium is the winter moratorium. And the winter moratorium protects electric, gas, and heat-related water customers with income at or below 250% of the federal poverty level from December 1st to March 31st. So anyone below 250% of the federal poverty level is protected regardless of whether they take those additional steps um, to apply for available assistance. However, they should do so anyway. They should get that assistance if it is available. Um, but it, technically, there's sort of two moratoriums on top of each other right now. The next steps um, to maintain, uh, hopefully, uh, the COVID-19 moratorium, or at least to, to give the PUC something real to think about before it lifts that moratorium, is that comments are due on February 16th. So you will see some, uh, some mobilization between now and then to get some comments to the PUC regarding the need for ongoing protections um, from loss of utility service. If the PUC doesn't take action, um, the protected customer status, much like the winter moratorium, will expire on March 31st, 2021. So what are we looking at? Um, you know, we, we, we can't know the full scope of things as they will be on March 31st, but we know as of the end of December, that there are over 847,000 accounts that would be eligible for termination if termination were allowed to proceed uh, at that time. And that's a 17% increase above what the number would have been on, on uh, December 31st, 2019. Um, in addition to the number of customers, the extent of the utility debts is uh, massively higher than it was a year ago. Um, the debts have reached nearly 812 million as it shows here. So um, in, in light of that, um, those bad things that appear to be looming, um, nonetheless, the utility moratoria has been beneficial. It has reduced both the rate of infection and the rate of mortality. Um, and this is from a, a nationwide study. So we believe the same is likely true here in Pennsylvania, that without the moratorium that was put in place in March, we would likely have dealt with a much steeper curve over the, uh, the, the summer months and on into the fall, where we're now seeing a, a lessening of a very steep curve that we've seen. So let's move along. So what's that mean? That means that um, the expectation from the utilities anyway is that the order will expire, uh, much like the winter moratorium does every year, the COVID-19 moratorium would expire. So um, that means termination notices, right? And that can happen as soon as yesterday, because under the PUC's regulations, a termination notice has a shelf life of 60 days. So if, if the utility is allowed to commence termination on April 1st, it can deliver a notice as early as the beginning of February. So we may start seeing people, right, who are coming in and what questioning, am I going to be able to maintain my service? And that's why we need to mobilize. So, as I mentioned, you know, there is a, a possibility the PUC could act. Um, it is uncertain at this time if they will take action to extend the moratorium. Um, there are some indications that that's, you know, that that's possible. There are some indications it's unlikely. So we really don't know yet. And we have to look at really what's going on across the state with the spread of the virus and, um, and how the stimulus funds and other things can respond to the needs that have accumulated. But the realistic step to do now is to start preparing for the likelihood that there will be a wave of notifications and a real need for customers to have good information to take the steps necessary to protect their service. So what can you tell clients and constituents who are at risk of shutoff? There are a number of different things and these are sort of presented, I think, in, in what is sort of the order that we would recommend. Um, first of all, it is important, you know, that even if someone can't pay in full, that they make some payment. Um, a good faith effort to keep up with the bills can go a long way in arguing for a, a second chance with the utilities. So we do encourage customers always to pay what they can. Even if they've fallen behind, at least pay the current bill each month if you can. Um, contacting the utility, 
providing information about the household income and composition to see what types of programs and benefits may be available, sort of the next step to take. Um, beyond that, there are assistance programs and, and customers really, uh, the PUC has made it clear in that phase two order that to remain protected under that order, customers should apply for all available assistance programs. And of course, that's, that's, a, that's a good sort of policy objective anyway. We want people to get the help that they need if it is available to them. Um, so the utilities can provide um, directions and, and applications and, the, and our constituents really should try to apply for those programs. There are special protections that are available for certain customers. So obviously if someone is medically vulnerable, they may have a, a different set of protections available to them, including the right to file a, a medical certification. And in some utilities, um, there are exceptions to other limitations on assistance programs. For example, uh, some of the programs have maximum benefits, but folks who may be medically vulnerable could be exempt from those maximum benefits. Victims of domestic violence have additional protections under the state statute. So the Public Utility Code recognizes that victims of domestic violence can be in a position of having increased vulnerability to a loss of utility service, um, particularly when uh, their abuser has limited their access to the things that are necessary for them to uh, remain connected and to address all of the, the household obligations. We're gonna talk a little bit about some special rights for tenants later, so um, just flag that for later. Um, and if someone's not available, you know, someone is not eligible for these assistance programs, what they really need to do is try to get a payment arrangement, something affordable to make payment and continue service going forward. There are limited statutory rights to that, which is why it's important to have a positive payment history so that the utility can see that the, it's worth giving another shot to a customer who may not have the statutory right to it. Finally, um, any, any customer who believes that the utility has an obligation to serve them in a way that they're not being served can seek to dispute the utility's actions. And there are internal dispute processes. And you begin that by telling the utility, I want to dispute you know, the bill. I want to dispute your denial of my application. I want to dispute this shutoff notice because I don't think you should be shutting me off. And that should trigger a process within the utility. Um, and and the, the client should really be advised at that point to also say, I want a written report of the outcome of my dispute. Because with that written report, the customer can then file a PUC complaint that the utility has not addressed their dispute adequately. Um, the customer can go straight to the PUC, but each of these steps, if taken in succession, will continue the service in place as long as the subject of the dispute is whether or not the utility should be able to proceed with the termination. The last resort is, um, is, is always really to consult with a bankruptcy attorney. Um, bankruptcy is kind of the silver bullet. It, it, it freezes all collections on your outstanding indebtedness, uh, not at the end of the road, but at the beginning of the road. So as soon as you file, the utilities have special obligations. They actually um, are forbidden from taking actions that can, you know, can result in your loss of service. Uh, they have the right to demand some payment within 20 days. Um, but if someone is facing a, a loss of service and they're eligible for a bankruptcy and a potential discharge of the utility debt, that's something they really should consider. And so they should really try to find a, a bankruptcy attorney if they're at that point. I think that might be my last slide. Let's see what's next. Yeah, that's it for me for now, but I'll be happy to tag in on the Q&A and I'll turn it over to Pulp. Hello everyone, my name is Maddie Keaton and I am the Energy Justice Coordinator at Pulp. Uh, I'm gonna be talking to you a little bit about utility assistance programs. Uh, of course, it's always important to get clients into these programs whenever they're struggling to pay their bills, but especially, especially when we are seeing these moratoriums end, it's more important now than ever to be aware of these programs and the eligibility guidelines and benefits of said programs. Uh, this is a list of some of the programs available, mostly at the regulated utilities. We are not going to go into detail about all of them today, 
but we will be talking about customer assistance programs or CAP programs, hardship funds, the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program or LIHEAP, the Low Income Usage Reduction Program, LIHEAP, um, and we won't so much be talking about CARES uh, programs or local county level assistance programs, uh, and of course getting help at churches and local nonprofits. Uh, but it's important to be aware that, you know, if, if your utility company doesn't have a CAP program or you don't qualify for it, or any of the other programs we'll be talking about today, uh, it's also important to be looking locally uh, at the county level and at local nonprofits as well. So if we can go to this slide. Uh, what if you get your service from an unregulated utility? So as we talked about a bit before, unregulated utilities include municipal water and sewer authorities and rural electric co-ops. Um, I think we mentioned this in a previous slide, but this does not include PGW, Philadelphia Gas Works, or PWSA, Pittsburgh Water and Sewer Authority. Uh, they count as regulated utilities. Um, so while a select few of these organizations may offer small hardship funds or payment arrangements, it's really important to be aware that most do not. Um, there's not much that can be done to prevent termination from an unregulated utility, and they just don't provide many of the programs that I'll be talking about over the next few minutes. Um, and it's also important to note that federal rental and utility assistance may soon be available uh, to assist with unregulated as well as regulated utility bills uh, for renters specifically. And that's something that my colleague Liz will be talking about later in the presentation. So first we'll start off with talking about customer assistance programs or CAP. Uh, CAP falls under a lot of different names, including PCAP, CRP, et cetera. Uh, each company tends to sort of use a, a different acronym or name. And some regulated water companies also offer limited assistance programs. You may have heard of H2O or Helping Hand. Uh, generally, the benefits of CAP programs include reduced rates and lower monthly payments and any past debt that you've accrued. Uh, you can also hear the term arrearages is frozen and debt forgiveness is earned over time. So as you make your monthly CAP payment, debt that you've accumulated in the past will be frozen and slowly forgiven uh, after a set amount of months. Uh, CAP programs do have some general eligibility requirements. The first is typically your income has to be at or below 150% of the federal poverty limit. Uh, one exception to this is people's gas, people's natural gas. Uh, you have to be at or below 200%. You also, of course, have to be a customer of that utility. They may ask you for your social security number, but it is not required. So uh, if that's something that your client doesn't have access to, or maybe they don't have a social security number, that may be something important to remember uh, that even if it's asked for, it is not required uh, to be enrolled in a CAP program. And some utilities may also require applicants to be payment troubled, uh, and they will have a specific definition for that as well. So any debt that you collect while you're in a CAP program is ineligible for a payment arrangement. Um, and I'll be talking about payment arrangements in a bit, but it's, it's just important to keep note of that. Uh, and your CAP bills must always be paid in full or the household may be removed from the program and you will be at risk for termination. So again, it's important to note that if you enroll in a CAP program, it's especially important to keep up with, with these lower payments. Uh, or else you will be at risk of termination, and um, that's not good for any household. Uh, often the amount that a utility quotes on a termination notice includes arrears, which are eligible for deferment through CAP. Um, again, that's something I mentioned a bit about before, and if someone receives a termination notice while they are enrolled in CAP, they should always ask if there is a lesser amount they can pay to stay in CAP 
and avoid termination. Again, I can't highlight this enough. It is really important uh, to, to stay in a CAP program to, to keep your arrears, your arrearage forgiveness eligible. Um, so even if you have to call your utility company and say, you know, I, I really can't afford this CAP payment this month, is there any way that I can pay a lesser amount for now so that I can stay in the program? Uh, it's worth a try to ask that. Next are hardship funds. Again, according to whatever utility company you're a customer of, these will all have different names. Uh, Dollar Energy, Operation Help. Uh, again, some of the water programs have hardship funds available as well, H2O, Helping Hand. And again, these are offered by most regulated gas, electric, and water utilities. Some general benefits. Again, this sort of varies by program and by company, but generally it's grant assistance uh, with the maximum grant amount being between $300 to $500. Uh, eligibility requirements, again, these are very general guidelines, but it varies by company. Uh, income at or below 200% of the federal poverty limit. Uh, a recent good faith payment so Rob mentioned this a few slides ago, but you know it, it's really important to pay what you can when you can, uh, and that's especially important here. And importantly, the grant, together with other potential resources, must generally resolve the termination. Um, it's important to, to remember that. Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, or LIHEAP. So we are currently in the LIHEAP season uh, this past year, and this year it ran from November 2nd, 2020, and it's running until April 9th, 2021. Uh, there's a potential for the season to be extended due to the pandemic, but that's not guaranteed in any way. Uh, there are various types of assistance that you can get through LIHEAP. So you can get a cash grant, anywhere from $200 to $1,000, a crisis grant, $25 to $800, or emergency furnace or service line repair or replacement. Uh, some general eligibility guidelines, a number you'll be hearing a lot, again, 150% of the federal poverty limit. You have to have a home heating responsibility, so you are uh, in charge of paying the heat for your home. You have to be a Pennsylvania resident, and specifically to be eligible for the crisis grant, you must also have an actual or imminent home heating emergency that can be resolved by the crisis grant specifically. So similar to the previous program uh, I talked about, and it's pretty simple to apply. Uh, generally, you'd be able to apply in person at a county assistance office, but many of those are closed right now due to the pandemic, so you can apply online. Uh, if your client does not have access to a computer or internet access, you can request hard copies to be mailed to you that you can, you know, physical copies that you can hand out. Um, tenant eligibility. So there are specific requirements in place if you are a tenant and you want to uh, have LIHEAP funds if you're struggling to pay your heat. Uh, if heat is included in the rent, the tenant is eligible for LIHEAP assistance. Uh, the exception with this is public housing recipients whose rent is based on a percentage of their income. Uh, and in this case, if your heat is included in your rent, the grant will go directly to the applicant or the tenant, not to the landlord or the property manager. Uh, now, if the heat is an undesignated portion of the rent, so, you know, it's indirectly part of the total rent cost, the tenant is only eligible for 50% of the grant amount. Uh, again, if you fall under the first category listed in the first bullet point, the heat is included in your rent, you would get the full amount of the grant. Um, another important thing to know about is mixed status household eligibility. So a household with members of different immigration statuses may apply for LIHEAP, but it's important to know that undocumented household members are excluded for the purposes of calculating household size, but their household income is included. Uh, so you'll have to do sort of some special calculations to decide whether or not a household with family members of different immigration statuses uh, would be eligible for LIHEAP funds. 
Uh, we actually recently, I believe in November, did a webinar on LIHEAP where we went into these details uh, a lot more. So if you're interested in learning more about LIHEAP specifically, uh, please be sure to check out our recording of the webinar. It is on YouTube. Uh, I believe it's on the Pennsylvania Legal Aid Network's YouTube channel. So if you don't feel like typing in the link, you can you can just search LIHEAP webinar with PA Legal Aid Network and it should come up. All right, next is the Low Income Usage Reduction Program uh, or LIRP. So there are Maddie, lots of before you move on, there was a good question in the chat box that I want to make sure that folk, like we're answering questions as they come in, um, but about LIHEAP and tenant eligibility that I think is important to clarify before we move on to, to LIRP. Um, and the question is just um, some clarification around uh, when heat is included as a portion of rent. So if you can go back to that slide really quickly, I just want to clarify that, yes, if you are a renter and your lease or your rental agreement includes heat, um, you can still access LIHEAP assistance. If it is an a, a undesignated portion, so say heat is included, you pay, you know, $800 a month, um, then you would only be eligible for 50% of the grant amount. But if you have a rental agreement that says you owe, you know, 800 a month in rent and then you also have to pay to, you know, the property manager or the uh, landlord um, this amount um, for the heat, you are still eligible for LIHEAP and should absolutely apply. That grant will go directly to the individual because DHS does not have a vendor agreement with every landlord. Um, so that's the distinction I wanted to make and uh, sorry for jumping in. You, you can keep going. No, yeah, I just thank you. I, that was I'm just chugging along and so I see that things are popping up, but yeah, please stop me again if, if any other questions. But th those distinctions are very important um, and and they are a bit confusing. So we're happy to talk a little bit more about that uh, at the end as well, if it would be helpful. Um, but now to move on to LIRP. So some of the benefits of LIRP, energy audit and education, uh, energy conservation measures could be installed in the home and, and there's a long list of different measures that could be installed, including, you know, appliance replacement, uh, insulation, heating equipment repair, etc. Um, there are also some limited health and safety measures that could also be included, uh, including the installation of smoke detectors, uh, ventilation, some other things. So it, it sort of varies case by case based on the energy audit of the individual home. To be eligible, generally, uh, it's up to 200% of the federal poverty limit. Uh, you have to be a Pennsylvania resident for at least nine or 12 months. Again, this varies by company. Uh, you have to have uh, high usage, high energy usage. And again, this number will also vary by company. Uh, and if you are a tenant, you are eligible for this. You just have to have landlord approval. Uh, and it's important to note that the Federal Weatherization Assistance Program or WAP and Act 129 programs are also available. They provide very similar benefits. Um, so you can look into all of the programs to help uh, make your home more energy efficient and thus lower your bill. So next we have Lifeline. Uh, we don't work with Lifeline nearly as much as, as we work with helping people apply for some of these other programs, but it's always important to note because a lot of people aren't aware of it. Um, but generally the benefits of Lifeline, you get $9.25 as a monthly subsidy for telephone, broadband, or bundled service. Uh, so the subsidy cannot be applied to equipment cost, but some providers will offer it for free. And the benefit is also portable to other providers if you switch providers. Uh, so to be eligible, you have to be at 135% or below of the federal poverty limit. Uh, and there's sort of a categorical eligibility. Uh, you can see the list there. You're a SNAP recipient, you're a Medicaid recipient, et cetera. Uh, and it's one benefit per household. So it, it's not a lot of money to go towards your telephone and internet bills, but 
you know, if you're eligible and you're struggling to afford some of these necessary services for life, uh, it can be a helpful monthly benefit. And now I'm going to turn it over to Liz. Hey everyone, um, I am going to take us through um, uh, some of the strategies for both preventing uh, a shutoff uh, or connecting service. Um, you know, uh, given that all of these programs, there are still folks that are either not going to be eligible for assistance um, and that may have special concerns. Uh, so what happens, right? And and uh, both Pulp and CLS and, and other legal service providers across the state uh, and social services Service providers see this every year, right? Because um, there's always folks that can't uh, stay connected to service. And so there are a number of rules that will protect uh, vulnerable customers and, and low-income customers um, from the loss of service. So it's important you all know about what those strategies are. We certainly are looking at a much different scale than ever before. Um, and we are anticipating a lot of high call volumes. I've talked with utilities the last couple of months. They are ramping up in, in uh, many other call centers to be able to handle uh, what's coming. Um, but it's important for all of you to know to be able to refer people in the right direction. So I'll start off with, with here's our, you know, Rob talked about, you know, some of the advice that we give to clients, pay what you can, uh, you know, contact the utility, um, but wh where are the customer's rights? And so uh, the first one, the best strategy pre for preventing a shutoff is going to be getting people into the right assistance programs if they are eligible. So that is always the first line of defense. There are some really great programs out there. Um, you know, generally we see that a lot of these programs are only at about 20 or 30 percent um, uh, enrollment rate for those estimated to be eligible. So there's certainly a lot of people that we can still connect with those programs. The second uh, is if there's no available assistance programs, there might be payment arrangements available. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit more about both payment arrangements and medical certificates um, if somebody is facing an imminent termination. Um, in a moment. I want to dive deeper in that. But there's a couple other strategies that I'm going to talk about now briefly. One is, and Rob mentioned this before, that there's additional protections for victims of domestic violence. And we had a good question about that earlier, and I said we'd address it later in the presentation, and now is that time. Uh, and so victims of domestic violence, if they have a protection from abuse order, uh, whether it be a temporary PFA, an emergency PFA, or a final PFA, or if they have some other court order issued by a, a court in Pennsylvania that ha shows the person is a victim of domestic violence, they will have some additional protections. The biggest protections are they cannot be charged with debt that was accrued in a third party's name. Uh, that is, even if they lived at the property at the time. And so one of the key things with the, this and for victims of domestic violence is they there's occupant liability in Pennsylvania. And so if you are an adult over the age of 18 and you live in a house with somebody else, it doesn't matter if the bill is in your name or their name. Everybody in that household is generally liable. So for victims of domestic violence, this causes a problem, particularly when they don't have access to the household resources or know what kind of debt is being accrued. Um, uh, it can really create a lot of barriers when that victim is transitioning um, and trying to set up service on their own. Perhaps they've you know, uh, moved on from the better, want to get a uh, new life established. Uh, that utility debt can prevent them from getting public housing. It can get, prevent them from getting pri uh, private housing uh, because if you can't establish service in your name, uh, that's going to create challenges. So um, this is a really important protection. And if a, a survivor has uh, one of these orders, um, they should contact their utility, provide a copy of that. And then if there's debt, uh, it, you know, that, that was accrued by the batter while they live together, that can't prevent them from getting new service. It also can't cause them to be terminated. Um, 
they also have the ability to get some additional or more flexible payment arrangements uh, based on facts and circumstances rather than just strictly what their income is. So it would take into account the fact that they're a survivor of domestic violence and, and need some additional um, economic assistance. Um, there's also a four year rule, that's what we call it anyway, um, where arrears that are more than four years old uh, can't be required uh, to be paid as a condition of providing service. It also can't form the, the basis of a termination. So this is the case if somebody's been off, off the, the service for several years, um, you know, perhaps they had a, an apartment or two in, in between where uh, utility service was included. If the debt's more than four years old and they're trying to reconnect service uh, or establish new service in their name. They can't be prohibited just because they've got really old debt. Generally, that goes through collections. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it's considered separate and shouldn't be a barrier. And then there's this last uh, really important one. And s some folks have asked questions about it in the, in the Q&A um, with security deposits. And so uh, if you are cap eligible, which the commission has defined means anybody with household income at or below 150% of the poverty guidelines, they cannot be charged a security deposit. And so utilities may still assess a security deposit. That means they should call into their utility, tell them that they are low income, provide that income information, and that security deposit should be taken off their account. Um, so that shouldn't be a barrier to existing um, uh, uh, utility customers or those who are trying to connect service at a new residence. But let's dive, if we can go to the next slide, into payment arrangements a little bit more. So there's a couple of really important things here. Um, a payment arrangement accepts liability and agrees to pay the debt over a period of time in more than one or more payments. One really important thing is if the person disputes the underlying amount of the, the debt that they're said they're owed. Maybe they think that there's a problem with their meter or they're a victim of domestic violence and this debt is, you know, the batter is not theirs, but it's been put onto their bill. Um, accepting liability for that debt and agreeing to a payment arrangement can get the person in trouble. They've, they've then agreed that they owe the debt and so they can't continue to challenge it. So not accepting liability for debt that you don't think you owe. That may be a reason to file a complaint with the utility and then possibly with the PUC. Um, the other big thing is um, trying not to agree to a payment arrangement that you can't afford to pay. And so an important thing to keep in mind is that the utilities have really wide discretion for the length of time that they can issue a payment arrangement for. Um, there are some, some requirements for utilities that, um, you know, have, uh, or for the commission, if the commission is going to issue a payment arrangement. But as far as from the utilities perspective, they could issue a long Longer one. So I've noted in, we've noted in this presentation, uh, some of the utilities have set up kind of automatic payment arrangements that if you call in and you have debt, you can, without talking to anyone, go through the automatic um, uh, voice uh, service and set up a payment arrangement. Those are not going to be based on household income. And so if you're working with a low income person, um, if they just agree to whatever payment arrangement is given to them through the automatic system, it they may have been able to get a more generous payment arrangement based on their income. So we always recommend speak to the customer service representative, tell them that this, what the circumstances are, um, you know, what the household income is. And if what they're quoting you is not affordable, ask for a more affordable payment arrangement um, and, you know, share with them what, what it is that that family is facing, what, what, what are their challenges. And again, Rob mentioned earlier, we always recommend pay what you can when you can, that becomes really important when you're trying to negotiate a more favorable payment arrangement. If you can show that you've been trying, right? Even if it's, I tell my clients, even if it's $5 a month that you can pay to show that you are making an attempt that your income really isn't enough to allow you to pay that full amount. The utilities are generally very uh, willing to work with you if you're willing to work with them. So can we go to the next slide, please? Um, so this provides, I, I mentioned the commission has some, some uh, 
requirements they have to fit within if the commission is going to issue a payment arrangement. And so if you go to your utility and they say you've already broken a couple of payment arrangements, we're not going to give you another one. That customer can then call the PUC and request that the PUC issue them a new payment arrangement. Generally, the PUC can only issue one payment arrangement. So this is like a last bite at the apple. Um, and so they, they generally, if you've broken that one again, they can only issue another payment arrangement if the household has had some change in income. Um, uh, or household composition. So it's it's important to go to the PUC um, if you need that payment arrangement, but know that may be the last shot. Um, uh, they can, for somebody at or below 150% of the poverty guidelines, the payment arrangement can be up to 60 months if they're a customer. And a customer means they're either currently on or they've been shut off in the last 30 days. If they're attempting to reconnect service after that 30 days has passed, um, um, the commission is more limited in what they can issue. And so there's some time frames on there. You'll all get a copy of this um, presentation so you have it to reference. Um, but for now, let's move on to the medical certificates. So uh, medical certificates are in a really important uh, tool, especially when a family has somebody in their household that has a serious illness or a medical condition, um, and it can delay termination. It does not resolve underlying debt, and it is a, not a long-term solution. So it is really important that if you are helping somebody get a medical certificate, that you also help them get grant assistance, get enrolled in a CAP program, or get other utility assistance that will help address the underlying debt. But to know about what the medical certificate protections are, a household can, can uh, obtain a medical certificate if they or anyone in their, their household, any of their household members, has a serious illness or a medical condition which requires utility service to treat that illness. And so um, that would be things like diabetes requires refrigeration, and so that may be necessary. But this is a decision um, whether or not they f that person fits the criteria. That's a decision that's reserved between the doctor or the physician assistant or the nurse practitioner and their patient, whether or not that, uh, f that certifying individual uh, believes that that, that client rises to that level and meets that definition. Um, so it's not up to the utility to look at whether or not the underlying illness fits that definition. That is something that is purely within that, the uh, purview of the doctor and patient or the physician assistant or nurse practitioner. I say those three because they're the three types of professionals that can sign a medical certificate. Um, I know we're, we're running short and there's a lot of information to cover, so I'm going to sum up that medical certificates, essentially, they stop termination for 30 days. You can get uh, up to two renewals even if you aren't paying anything on the underlying debt. If you are paying your current charges as they become due, you are entitled to get additional 30-day medical certificates for as long as you're keeping up with your current charges, regardless of the underlying debt. But again, doesn't treat the, the symptom, right, and pay and catch people up with what they owe. So it's important to also deal with that debt. Um, I do note, as long as there are other protections to uh, use, a medical certificate is a last option. Um, it is a delay. Um, it provides really short-term protection, um, and it's a it's a hassle to get get one from your doctor, right? It requires you to go into your doctor, um, be seen, which sometimes requires an expensive copay or a long wait time. So there are a lot of other things we talked about today that I would recommend first. And if all else fails and the person has a, has a severe illness or medical condition, um, then seeking a, a medical certificate can get some additional time for that family. Let's go on to the next slide then. 
a couple of you asked about the uh, FPL level um, and uh, this is it. Um, and so based on the household members and uh, the various levels of FPL, this will, again, we're providing these slides to everybody who's registered. So they're, they're, they will be made available and you can reference back to this. Um, these are the 2021 federal poverty guidelines. Um, so I do note that the 2020 federal poverty guidelines are still in effect for LIHEAP through the end of the season. Um, so uh, that's a little bit lower um, uh, guideline than these 2021. But all the other programs generally will follow the 2021 guidelines now that they're in effect. Okay, tenant utility rates. I'm going to spend two minutes on these, um, and they're really important because we are seeing an uptick in the number of landlords who are attempting to um, uh, get tenants who have not kept up with their rent out by shutting off service to their property. This is an illegal tactic that they cannot do. Um, it is a, considered a constructive eviction from the home. And it, this is the one protection that we're going to talk about today that applies to both regulated and unregulated utilities. So generally, if a landlord has stopped paying, a renter has the right to, one, be notified of the arrearages. Um, they have to be given 30 days notice that there's a pending termination based on the landlord's failure to pay. They have to be given the opportunity uh, to pay for the last 30-day bill and to keep service ongoing to their residents, notwithstanding the landlord's additional arrearages. And then they're allowed to deduct that um, from their rent, the payments that they're making to the utility to keep service on. Um, and those, the, it provides that they're protected from retaliation uh, by the landlord. So they can't then move to evict that tenant for exercising their rights under uh, these provisions. And for regulated utilities, that would be pursuant to the Discontinuance of Service to Lease Premises Act. For unregulated uh, utilities, it's pursuant to the Utility Service Tenants Rights Act. Um, I also want to note that the, these uh, laws also protect against the, the landlord contacting the utility and saying, I'd like to cut service to this residence. It doesn't matter that they are the owner. They must um, provide um, an affidavit to the utility saying that the residence that they want to cut service to is either unoccupied or that the tenant has consented to them shutting service off. I have yet to run into a a tenant who is living at a property that consents to having service cut. Um, so if the landlord has submitted that affidavit, generally they are doing so uh, illegally. This is a case where I'd recommend you uh, connect your client uh, with the local legal services program who may be able to intervene on the client's behalf um, or otherwise connect them to, to an advocate. You can also have them call um, our utility hotline, though in, in unregulated utility cases, we are uh, given their local laws. Um, uh, we're statewide program, so we're not able to go to local court, which is why the local utility services, the, our local legal services program is the best referral there. Um, so I want to provide you, uh, again, I'm going to spend two minutes because we've got five minutes left, um, on an update to the rent and utility assistance programming that has come from the federal government. Um, so back in late December, uh, I'm sure everybody on this webinar well knows that there was $25 billion coming from the feds in rental and utility assistance um, that is available to renters. Pennsylvania received about 800 and just shy of 850 million. Um, and then uh, that money went, some of it went directly to large counties and cities with populations of 200,000 or more. Uh, and the rest of it uh, is to be allocated to the state. Um, last week, Senate Bill 109 um, passed an allocation that would have DHS administer this money in block grants to all 67 counties, including those that receive some of the direct assistance, proportional to how big their counties are, so based on population. It includes some money for housing stability services that is going to be set to be administered at the county level. Um, and all of this is pending consideration right now in the House. So we are hopeful 
um, that it will get out to the counties very quickly, that programs that are workable for utility assistance will be set up. And we are trying to work with as many folks uh, in the housing sphere and the utility sphere. There's an awful lot of stakeholders at the table trying to get this money out and trying to get it set up so that it will get to families. Um, and we're hopeful that that will happen very quickly. And so this, um, you know, to be continued um, and, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're hopeful that it'll get out quickly to those in need. Can we move to the next slide? So, uh, you know, I a uh, number of places that you can call here. One, if somebody's about to be shut off, the utility is the first line of defense. If they haven't contacted the utility to try and work out enrolling in an assistance program or a payment arrangement, that's really the first place to call. The, the Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission, their Bureau of Consumer Services will take informal complaints. It is a pro se friendly process and so clients get or customers can call directly, um, particularly if they've been denied a payment arrangement from the utility, um, you know, they can call and get a payment arrangement there. Or if they've been denied uh, access to one of the assistance programs and they believe they're eligible for it, they can file a, an informal complaint uh, with the commission. If they're challenging the amount that they owe, again, you can file an informal complaint with the commission. And if you are pending termination and you file your complaint at least 24 hours in advance of that termination, uh, filing an informal complaint will temporarily stop the termination until they've been able to work out your complaint. I'm not saying this to say call the commission if you are facing termination for any reason, but if you have a, uh, you know, a, if you're requesting a payment arrangement uh, or can't get connected with an assistance program, you've tried to submit a medical certificate and they won't accept it, Lots of reasons why uh, it, there might be good, valid reasons to delay that termination and in filing an informal complaint may be able to help. Um, we've put the uh, uh, link to the PA Legal Aid uh, Find Help absolutely connect there. There are uh, local legal aid programs serving every county in the state. And then if you are working with someone as an advocate um, or an attorney and you need some technical assistance, contact PULP or contact Community Legal Services and we are happy to help you through the process. Um, PULP also offers an emergency utility hotline, um, though that is a, uh, oh, Brian, um, I think we lost our, um, there we go. <laughs> um, so contact our emergency hotline. That is for clients only. The other contact is for advocates or attorneys seeking assistance. Um, and then if you're working with someone who's not low income, uh, the Office of Consumer Advocate can also help. Uh, they're within the Attorney General's office and a great resource as well. So can we, we uh, there's been a lot of great Q&A in the uh, chats and I know we're at one o'clock. Um, I believe that we'll be following up with some answers to unanswered questions. Um, uh, they're great questions. We have so many of you. I'm so grateful to the Housing Alliance and to all of you who've tuned in today. Um, and uh, I'll turn it back to Brian to uh, close us out. But um, you know, we'll try and get all your right an questions answered. Uh, but do feel free to reach out to us directly um, if you have any specific specific questions. Uh, thank you all very much for that wonderful and informative um, webinar. I hope you all enjoyed it. We will be sending out the slides with all the information and we'll be sending out um, answers to some of the questions too. Uh, so please be on a lookout for that and we thank you for coming. Take care. <laughs>